So, on to the next step, dealing damage to the body of any given character. So, we have our damage that we've done all our armor reduction, blah, 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 blah for. It is time to go to the living being health component and deal body damage. Now, each body section has a limb name that is associated with it. So, what we're gonna do... Ooh, hello, girl. Gonna sit here. All right, sorry for all the, the cat delays. So the character's health is made up of again another map, which is gonna map a body limb name. This is so that it's completely modular. So if we have something like a uh, like a spider that has eight legs, it's just you know leg one, leg two, or whatever we name them. Um, something that has like a tail, then the tail would be its own limb. And that way we can just reuse the same component, but give it different values or, you know, have a child component and that kind of thing. So we're going to, when we deal damage, go to the limb map, which maps a limb name to a struct. In this struct, we have the limbs fraction of global health. So let's say we have a hundred health total. The head is 15 health, the legs are 15 health each, the chest would be like 25 health each, and the arms would be 15 health each. That's just so that, you know, as a character gets more health, it's still proportionally, you know, distributed to all the all the limbs and whatnot. So when the damage enters the, enters the body of the character, there's a natural damage modifier map. So this is again just a map of hit body sections, and that maps to a struct of multipliers. So for example, the the neck of a humanoid character is very susceptible to slashing and piercing damage. Um, the joints like the knees and the elbows are really susceptible to impact damage and that kind of thing. Same with like the head. If you get knocked on the head, it does, you know, more damage than if you got uh, knocked on the leg or something. So we multiply that damage based on the hit section and then we deal damage to the limb that that hit body section is assigned to. So we got hit in the left elbow pit that's assigned to the left arm. So we're dealing damage to the left arm and we deal that damage by summing all of the damage types together and then subtracting that final damage from the current health of the limb. And that's as simple as that. Now, there are two health types. I've talked about this in, in another devlog, but essentially there is this pain damage, uh, which is sort of there to simulate like shock and, uh, you know, the initial pain of getting hit. That's sort of like incapaci inca incapacitative, incapacitative, incapacitative uh, kind of pain. So, you know, I just got hit in the arm and it's like, ow, fuck, that hurts. I can't use this arm very well. Uh, but then as that pain subsides, I can, you know, start using my arm again. And then there's also the injury health or like an injury value, which reduces the maximum health of the limb. Now there's another little function here called on limb break. And if the pain, you know, pain tolerance reaches zero, so the health reaches zero, then we fire this event and we pass in whatever the limb name was. And by using child components, so if we minimize here, if we go to the humanoid health component as opposed to the living being health component, we can actually override the on limb break event. And, you know, if it is the legs or the head, then ragdoll. And if it is the the arm or something, drop your weapon. And we can specify, you know, any kind of bespoke logic for any situation, for any creature type. So maybe we want to do something like, um, you know, let's say there's like a dragon or something and it keeps using its tail to like beat the shit out of you. We could do on the event that the limb tail breaks, then the tail falls off and it can no longer, you know, do those tail sweep attacks and that kind of thing. So that's just set up in a way that's pretty modular and very, um, very open for any kind of gameplay logic. And the way that those limb healths, limbs, limbs healths actually factor into gameplay is through the 
action system. If we go to something like basic melee attack or, or whatever, we can actually just get limb damage factor right arm and then remap that zero to one range. And then that comes out this end and we can just use that to do any kind of modifier to an action. So maybe, you know, in this case, it's adjusting the, the play rate of the animation. So when your arm's damaged, you swing your weapon slower. We could also do things like adjust the damage that the action deals. Uh, we could do like a physical reaction where the arm's like all floppy and can't aim properly. And all of that kind of stuff, we just query it as the action needs to be completed. So with that explained, I want to take a short moment to thank the sponsor of today's video, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning platform where you can learn absolutely anything that your heart might desire. As of late, I've actually started working with some other artists and programmers to speed up the development of the, the Prismatica project. Uh, more on that in a, in a future video. But as a part of that, I have been brushing up on all of my, my art skills, all of my design skills as well, so that I'm able to convey my ideas properly. So that's why I've been looking over the character design crush course, dynamic design in four steps by Melissa Lee. So I do encourage everyone to try the same thing. And by using code PRISMATICADEV on sign up, you will receive one free month of Skillshare membership. So once again, thank you very much to Skillshare for sponsoring today's video. So the last piece of this puzzle that we're gonna talk about, it's actually the first piece of the puzzle though, is how do we decide how much damage a weapon deals to you know a character that it has hit? So one thing that I really wanted to do with this project is to have a lot of weapon variation uh, and for it to actually be like meaningful weapon variation. So, you know, if you come across two long swords, they might be completely different in terms of, you know, what kind of damage they're dealing, how heavy they are, how fast they attack so that players can, you know, customize their sort of play style to a, to a greater degree. You can see that all of these weapons are quite different from one another. They all have different blade types. They all have different handle types. They all have different cross guards. Uh, they also have completely random sizes. So you might find weapons that are longer, but slower. It's also nice to just have variety, in my opinion. I think variety is the spice of games. So the way that we actually generate these these weapons, these sort of random modular weapons, whatnot, is we define a weapon class. So two-handed long swords would include things like, you know, European long swords, uh, swords like, you know, Lang Messes, single-edged, big boys, um, katanas for all those weebs out there, and, you know, thrust-centric two-handed weapons like Estocs. So if we go into items and then equipment and then weapons and then weapon data and then melee weapons and then longsword, then we have a data asset called default longsword assembly data. And this basically just has a list of possible parts that we can use for each element of the weapon. So if we actually go into one of these possible parts for a longsword, let's go to this one here. This one's called the pointy. It looks like this. It's just a very triangular cut and thrust sort of blade. And you can see that we are hit with a bunch of different values. It's a little bit of a, it's almost like a tree diagram or a matrix in, in some ways. Let's just say there are two main ways to use a weapon. You can thrust with a weapon and you can sweep with a weapon. Sweep or slice or swing. Now every weapon has parts of the weapon that, you know, are different from one another. So obviously if you thrust at someone, but you don't hit them with the point of the weapon. So let's say we're using a sword. If you thrust at someone and you miss them, but then you hit them with the, you know, the primary blade part of the weapon, that isn't going to be dealing piercing damage. That's going to be dealing slashing damage and to a lesser degree as actually like chopping with it. So that's something that I really wanted to try and replicate um, with this system. So what we do is we break each weapon into three parts. There is the point, 
which is the point. There's the primary. We'll just call it prim for now. Uh, this is like, you know, the blade of a sword or, you know, the chopping side of an axe or, you know, the head of a mace or whatever the, the primary damage dealing element of the weapon is. And then there's the handle. So this would be like the, the shaft of a, a pole arm or a spear, the handle of a sword and, and whatnot. Parts of a weapon for each of these attack types, we have damage modifiers. So we've got slash damage. We've got our pierce damage. Uh, P-I-E-R-C-E. -E. I before E except after C. That looks like it says Pience, but it says Pierce, trust me. Uh, and we have our impact. Impact. Obviously, all of the numbers that get entered are completely arbitrary. Um, so, for example, with this big sword blade, if we do a sweeping attack, so we're slashing with the sword, the point of the sword does one times slash damage, and 0.5 times impact damage, because obviously hitting anyone with anything is going to deal impact damage. The primary part of the weapon does the same, because in a sweep, it doesn't really matter if we hit with the, the tip trace or with the, the primary trace. Uh, either way, it's going to be dealing slashing damage. And if we hit them with the handle of the sword during a sweeping attack, we're not going to add, we're not going to multiply any damage because we're actually going to take the impact damage of the handle from the the butt of the weapon or the, you know, the, the handle in this case. So if we had a handle that had a, you know, a spike on the end of it, we might want to deal piercing damage when we hit them with the, the butt of the weapon. So like, you know, that would have dealt uh, a lot of pierce and impact damage to the, the head of the character. Um, like that. Oh, that was brutal. So, you know, if you are up close to enemies, um, chances are you will hit them with the butt of the weapon rather than the blade. And that kind of... Um, that's also like a balance and, you know, pros and cons of different weapons is... Let's say you've got a spear and spears are, you know, the, the ultimate weapon uh, on the battlefield. But as soon as someone is past the range, you know, of the tip of your spear, you're essentially defenseless. You, you can't actually stab someone with a spear if the spear is too long and they're way up close to you. So your only option at that point is to hit them with the, the shaft of the spear, or you could hit them with the, you know, the backside of the spear, or you could just draw another weapon and go ham. So that's another reason that I wanted to do, you know, separate trace points for a weapon. You can even see um, I've colored the, the debug traces so that blue is the handle, yellow is the primary damage dealing part, and red is the tip. Now, the way that we actually get those line traces to, to be different is in our weapon actor, we have this create trace socket array event. Uh, which happens whenever that weapon becomes an actor in the world. So we equip it, you know, on our body or in our hand or anything like that. And then what we do for each attack trace type, so the point, the primary, the handle, we go through all of the sockets that are on the, the skeleton uh, because our weapons are skeletal meshes. Now, the reason that they are skelly meshes um, is because they can't actually be instanced together anyway, so there's not that much benefit to doing static meshes. And also to accommodate for things like bows and uh, flails and maybe spears that are a little bit, little bit wobbly, it would just be really difficult to accommodate for scaly and static meshes to, you know, we'd have to like write a completely different thing for each type, so. But anyway, we search through all the sockets. We look for the ones that contain the name, point, primary, handle. And then we add them to a weapon trace array. And this trace array is an array of structs that say the name of the socket, the radius that it needs to trace, and what type, like enum-wise, it is. And then on the weapon itself, we can say, oh, this is 
this is how thick the the point trace should be or the primary trace the handle trace so for example if we had a like a mace or something um let's just say it's super super simple <laughs> uh we could just put a single trace point here and give it a radius of you know five uh and that would have accurate collision along that point and so when it comes time to actually do the traces of the weapon we just get that array and we go through each uh, attack trace socket and basically just yeah do its start and end position so start is always the previous frames position end is always the current frames position and that's how we get our our attack traces so for example if i thrust at a character and then move my weapon at the last second to like catch them in the arm with the the yellow part of the weapon you can see that we only dealt four slash damage zero pierce zero impact whereas if we hit them with the the point of the weapon we deal eight pierce damage and five impact damage because we actually hit with you know the appropriate part of the weapon it seems a little bit nuanced especially for a game that is from you know this top-down perspective um but i mean you do actually have a lot of control over where your hits land. I can pretty consistently hit these people in in the head. Like that. <laughs> when we actually construct a, a weapon, a weapon object, it has an array of the, the final weapon part array, which is an array of structs. And that struct contains pairs of the data asset for you know the weapon component and also what material that weapon component is made of so for example the blade might be made of gold for whatever reason if you're a psychopath and you can see that gold which is also a material that gets used for the armor and stuff has these weapon physical damage multipliers so slashing damage with gold is reduced by 20 percent piercing damage is reduced by 20 percent uh, impact damage should be increased by 20%. And again, that's just there for a little bit of variation. And, you know, when we start to get into things like um, more like fantasy metals and stuff, those will be a lot more extreme and they might have extra effects like dealing elemental damage or maybe one of them is like it can be super, super sharp. So it does heaps and heaps of extra slash damage, but at the cost of durability, like maybe it's really fragile or something. Like like obsidian, for example. Also think like uh, some metals that are completely resistant to acid and corrosion, or they are super, super heavy, but super, super durable. So like they slow you down, but they are more durable. That kind of variation, I think, will definitely play into the kind of min-maxing attitude that, um, that I'm very aware that some people have <laughs> so just to show how this kind of all works together i've actually got some print strings that happen up in the left and that will describe exactly what is going on behind the scenes with the uh, with the damage stuff so if i just attack at this person it says play character dealt 10 slash damage zero pierce five impact with the primary part of their weapon using a sweep attack then the armor the plate uh, which is like the thigh armor um, made of gold. The durability is now 0.5 and the cuisses, the gambeson armor of that same uh, type. You can see that its durability was lowered and the damage dealt, uh, it's disappeared, but it was there. You know, let's do another attack. We dealt 10 slash damage with the primary part of the weapon using a sweep attack. The plate arm harness, you know, reduced some damage. So we ended up dealing a total of 2.6 pain damage to their right clavicle so you might be wondering isn't this a little bit complex how are you gonna like convey this to the player aren't they gonna get super confused by all these numbers and my answer to that is they're just not gonna know about it none of the numbers are gonna be visible it's just gonna be a you know what you see is what you get um i tried attacking this person the armor made some sparks obviously i didn't hit their flesh uh, they don't seem bothered by it they're not limping they didn't drop their weapon 
There was no big blood spurt, whatever, whatever. There was a big, like, you know, a big chunky armor hit sound, you know, some auditory feedback. And so by having this kind of complicated back end, we can keep the game pretty, uh, like, descriptive rather than numeric. So, for example, let's say we pick up an item like a, you know, it's just called breastplate. And in the examine text, it might say, you know, plate armor is impervious to slashing and piercing damage at the cost of being quite encumbering. And then below that description, it might say this is made of, you know, some material. Maybe it's made of runite and maybe it's completely indestructible, but extremely heavy. And so by providing these descriptions, you can kind of just see, OK, if I equip this, I'm going to be moving slower, attacking slower because it's heavy, but my armor is never going to break or, you know, very unlikely to break. And whenever I get hit in the, the places that this piece of armor covers, it's going to block all slashing damage and piercing damage, but probably not as much impact damage. And so by having all of these different factors kind of combining and, and interweaving and playing together, we can get like a ton of meaningful gameplay variation. And so it'll reward players for, you know, not just being good at the, the game mechanically, but being good at the game knowledge wise. So I think with that being said, there isn't really too much else to talk about. Uh, I could go into depth about like how we're, I mean, obviously you can see these different character body types that are just randomly generated. And, you know, I could talk about how we update all the visuals for the armor. But, you know, if you watch my uh, character customization video like two devlogs ago, two or three devlogs ago, you'll know how all of the character materials constructed. Basically, the armor just updates the parameters when it gets equipped and blah, 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 blah. So that is it really for this for this devlog. I don't think there's anything else that really needs to be explained. There's a few more like nitty gritty things and more like in-depth code stuff, but I don't want to bore you with that too much. I think just giving the the sort of um, the gamer's explanation for how it works is probably enough. If you don't want to miss the next devlog, make sure you've subscribed and, and click the little get notifications bell icon thingo. If you need help with anything Unreal Engine related, you can join our Discord server in the links below, and you can also ask me questions live on Twitch, which I mentioned earlier in the video, but there's a link in the schmibbly dibbly. And lastly, but not leastly, I want to thank the patrons for making this all possible. The Patreon's gotten to a point where I can actually start to pay other people to do work for the game, which is... It's pretty unreal. Haha. <laughs> If you want to join them in supporting the development of the game and also the production of all of the Unreal Engine tutorials that I make, you can do so for as little as $1 per month through the Patreon, which is linked in the... So I guess with that, we say goodbye. Goodbye.